Good evening and welcome to A Course in Miracles, Chapter 17, Forgiveness and the Holy Relationship. Take off from where we left last night, so we're doing 17.6, Setting the Goal. And again, addressing the fundamental understanding of why we are here and how we recognize our divine self, our spirit, soul, as that which is the extension of God's eternal love. And so as we start again, let's recognize the present of the presence of the Christ mind um, as that which is the love of God calling us to know itself, to know our fractured beings, our fractured selves as one, one holy son of God, in God dreaming that we've separated, but yet we cannot, we're just dreaming we are. And this is fundamental in terms of saying the reason we do this course, for example, is we're searching. Ultimately, you may have appropriated um, the spiritual concept that you're searching for God or searching to know Christ or searching to know your relationship with God better or to know yourself in God. But these are concepts. Um, and although they are concessions of the truth, ultimately, what is it that we're all looking for and we're ultimately all looking for the permanence and security of unconditional love, happiness, and peace. So we're really all looking to be permanently happy. And everything we've done in our lives, if we're very honest with ourselves, before we understood the non-dualism of A Course in Miracles, which is really non-duality or non-dualistic non Christian mysticism, it's a path, many a paths to get to the truth. We've, we've gone the Course in Miracles path, which makes use of old Christian terms and hence non-dualistic Christian mysticism. Why mysticism? Because it seeks to know, it seeks for the mystery, the understanding of the truth within ourselves. It's turning inwards as opposed to outwards. And so the fundamental part of this is we want to know ourselves as happiness and we want the permanence of it. We don't just want to understand it as a concept. Understanding definitely transcends belief in the unknown, but we want to go beyond understanding and we want to go to the full knowing. And we ourselves cannot transcend understanding to knowing. That's the miracle. And so what we do is we prepare ourselves through the process of forgiveness to undo, to empty the cup, whereby the Holy Spirit then takes us and transcends our understanding into the full knowing. And once you fully know your essential nature, your essence, your very essence, and that's the only word I can use, forget about the word spirit being, or spirit or soul, the very essence, the energy which you are, the life spark, beyond, way before body, mind, projection, identification, the very essence of you, which is essential nature is the very essence of God and is the same essential nature as God, unconditional love. And once we know that self in full awareness, what we think was mind and thoughts, we realize is just awareness. Mind is pure awareness. And the minute thought, which is an activity of fallen asleep mind, enters our awareness and we see it, we just don't engage. We stay in the awareness. We stay in the I am. The minute we engage the thought, the thought consumes us and we localize. And then we appropriate that. We appropriate the thought. And the minute we appropriate the thought, we think we're thinking. Thought then explores and fractures into sub thoughts and ideas. And the next thing we're now localized in thinking, thinking it's in our mind, which means we're now out of awareness. So either you're aware of thoughts or you're in pure awareness. And in pure awareness, just like when you're totally happy, completely happy in the moment, when you're completely happy in the moment, there's no thought. Think about it. Think about it. When you're totally happy, no thought. And so thought 
is the medium of fallen mind. Fallen mind, wrong mind. Awareness, right mindedness. And so let's understand how we approach our how we approach, what's the process of approaching the condition to set ourselves ready that Holy Spirit may remove the final obstacles to peace and transcend our understanding into knowing. And please make a note, if, if that hasn't been completely clear, when we stop for questions, please um, make a note of, of reminding me to ex, ex, expand on that a little longer. So setting the goal. The practical application, and it's always practical. Spirituality is very complicated. Religion is even more complicated. Dogma is both religion and spirituality. The course is non-duality. That's as close as you get to explaining it. Non-dual understanding. And it is always practical. Holy Spirit always gives you a practical application. So the practical application of the Holy Spirit's purpose, what is the Holy Spirit's purpose? It's extremely simple, okay? But it is unequivocal. It's without a shadow of a doubt. In fact, in order to be simple, it must be unequivocal. It must be simply understood without a shadow of a doubt. Because when doubt creeps in, it's a thought. And so proof needs to be given by Holy Spirit to our fractured self that is searching for truth. So that the fractured self, the idea, the identity dissolves and the self is known as our self, as that which is aware of being awareness itself. You repeat it. As that which is the awareness of being awareness itself. Another way of saying that, I am that I am. No more explanation. The simple is merely what is easily understood. For this, it is apparent that it must be clear. The setting of the Holy Spirit's goal is general. Now, I highlighted this for a reason so I wouldn't forget. It's another way of saying, and you may have heard Rupert Spira say this, and he says it beautifully. The Holy Spirit or the universe or God, okay, so people love to go, they don't like to say God anymore because it's, Associates, so spiritual people don't use the word God. You know, the universe will provide bullshit. Universe provides absolutely fuck all. The universe is the activity of your dreaming mind, and you're an activity in that dreaming mind, observing the dreaming mind from a localized perspective, thinking it's outside you, as you are completely unaware that you're an activity of mind. So the setting of the Holy Spirit's goal is completely general. Therefore, the Holy Spirit only answers impersonal goals. Impersonal means you're not asking for people, places, things, and events. That's it. It's impersonal. So you're not asking, please, can I have a husband so that I can be happy? Please, can I have a job so I'll be happy? Please, can I have a child so I'll be happy? You're asking only Please, can I know that I am that which is God's happiness? You're getting to non-generalization from a humanistic point of view into a non-dual understanding. So you're generalizing from a non-dual perspective. What is it that I really want the relationship for? Why do you want the fancy house, the fancy car, the fancy child, the fancy husband or wife or whatever it is? The romantic love relationship. You want those things. You want the experience. You want the activity. Because you hope that that activity, you hope that that activity is going to make you happy and is going to retain your happiness. So you don't really want the car, person, place, blah, 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 because you, you, you think it's going to make you happy. What you really want is the happiness. So you ask for happiness or more importantly, even closer to the truth, you ask that you remove the obstacles to peace that allow you to know your peace and peace becomes joy and joy becomes love. And love and joy and peace is what makes you happy. So when you know yourself as peaceful and you know yourself as joyous, when you know yourself as love, you are happy. And now the Holy Spirit will work with you to make it specific. 
but you're not asking for specifics. You're asking for happiness. And how does he make it specific? It's the law of attraction. It's what you call attraction. You're attracted to something. You're attracted to someone. You're attracted to an activity. You have a vision of building something, creating something, building a business, painting, creating music, whatever it is that is your creative natural natural talent, which is how Holy Spirit calls you. So you're being imbued with what's called natural talent, which is a certain characteristic of, of God's Holy Spirit playing out through your body mind. And so it calls you to know yourself through those activities. So if you're attracted and you still would like to have a romantic relationship, don't deny it because you're spiritual. If you're called to and you're attracted to someone and, and they're attracted to you and, and you move into a relationship, know this much. The relationship's not going to make you happy. If you're happy, the relationship extends your happiness, expands your happiness. If you're unhappy, that relationship's going to extend and expand your unhappiness. And that's okay if you're willing to dedicate the relationship to the Holy Spirit, to the knowing of truth. Why? Because then that, that relationship will bring to the surface your subconscious pent-up guilts and fear to be forgiven, which is the clearing of the obstacles to peace so that you can know that you are happiness, that you are love, that you are joy, because true love is the absence of bodies. There are, there are certain very specific guidelines he provides for any situation, but remember that you do not yet realize their universal application. So you think, oh, I'd love a special love relationship, you know, and that relationship, there's an attraction between the two of you, and there's a spark, and there's this fire in this romantic period, which is going to bring the subconscious guilt to the surface to be forgiven. But why? Because you hadn't forgiven your mother or your father or your, your teenage years or your first lover or your first husband, wife, or your children that have. So the, the attraction to the next relationship as amazing as you think it's going to be your salvation, because we always think someone else is going to save us, or we're going to save someone else, and therefore we're special. The whole purpose of it is to bring all of that guilt to the surface. And so don't think that this relationship is going to be any different to the ones you've had before where you've been hurt, bruised, abandoned, rejected, et cetera, et cetera. As amazing as the new romantic love relationship appears to be, it's going to turn. It's going to turn and it's going to press every fucking Cynthia guilt button in your subconscious mind. Thank God for that. Okay. Therefore, ask to remember that you are happiness, not for people, places, things, and events. Therefore, it is essential at this point, holy son of God, teacher for God, use them in each situation separately until you can more safely look beyond each situation in an understanding far broader than you now possess. So you're called to go and do a job, move country, whatever the case may be. There's this passion inside you that wants to go on a venture, go on a holiday, meet someone, go on a dating site, meet someone, you meet someone you're attracted. Don't say, oh, no, I'm spiritual. Don't give up your day job. Don't give up your job that pays you a decent salary just because you're spiritual. That's just ludicrous. You're now, you've made the job real and now you're denouncing it. Now you're pushing it away. So what happens? You've made illusions real and now you reject illusions. You're not meant to reject illusions. You're meant to love your creations, realizing that you misperceive them and you see them as illusionary. What you're really looking upon in everything People, places, things, and events. All of them is the light with which you see. God is the light. Everything's an echo for the voice for God. So don't denounce, don't reject, don't abandon, don't detach. There's a very big difference between detachment. To detach means you are attached and now you let push away. Okay. You become non-attached. You open your hand ever so gently. If it stays, it stays. If it doesn't, it floats away. So don't detach, don't reject, don't isolate. 
because then you're rejecting yourself again. And that's a mistake the ancient church did. You know, priests that would hide in little tombs and beat themselves up, mia culpa, mia culpa. And now spiritual people do the same and they go and, and get off the grid or hide or, you know, reject the world. Don't reject the world. You're rejecting yourself. The world is you. The universe is you. Love it. Accept it unconditionally with forgiven eyes and recognize everything as an echo for the voice of God, God's Holy Spirit, the memory of God, the essence of God is in everything. And when you see the essence of God in its purity, you see the Christ everywhere, not Jesus. You're not seeing Jesus. You're seeing the essence which Jesus became when he transcended the body-mind identity and became the light of the mind infused with the Holy Spirit, the memory of God. Christ is now the mind that calls you to know itself as itself. You, the body-mind separated, when you awaken to God's reality, you awaken as one, the Christ. Both you and Jesus and every other person in the world fuse into one being. And that being, the minute it becomes self-aware fully, awakens in God and realizes, I but I had a dream that never happened in true reality. And as minute it realizes it, but I had a dream, it won't even remember the dream existed. In any situation in which you are uncertain, the first thing to consider very simply is, what do I want to come of this? What is it for? What's the relationship for? What's the car for? What's the job for? Take it from someone who ended up with 30 motorcycles. As soon as he had one, oh, the search ended. Happy, happy. A week later, oh, I need the next one. Eventually, 30 motorcycles. What the hell? You know, it was never enough. And of course, the ego gave it all sorts of wonderful. Oh, I'm collecting classic motorcycles. They were just a pain in the ass. Trickle charges, license fees, dead batteries, constantly having to service them. When do you get a ride with 30 motorcycles? You don't. No. So just never happy. Never, just next, next, more, 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 more. Didn't make me happy. The clarification of the goal, vital, belongs at the beginning. To be very clear as to, so ask yourself right now, why am I doing this? Why am I doing A Course in Miracles? It's Thursday night. I should be out partying with my friends and having a joyous celebration of life. Why am I sitting here listening to this rogue teacher for God? Why? Okay. So clarify the goal. For it is this which will determine the outcome. And so let's set it right here as we speak. I want to be permanently happy. And I want the security of permanent happiness. And that happiness needs to lead to a permanent state of peace, a permanent state of unconditional love for all of it. I don't want to see sin. I want to only see joy. I want to know Christ as myself. I want to know God as that which I, which is, I'm the extension of him. I'm, I'm part of God. I want to know that joyous source of all creation, the joyous source, which is my joy. I am spirit and I abide in God. God is spirit and abides in me. And I want to know that without a shadow of a doubt, completely know it, not conceptualize it, understand it, given my life to some savior, or, you know, some conceptual savior that no one really understands, no matter how much they believe in him, no one really understands it. Why? Because a dualistic understanding never brings peace, never. It brings a certain amount, but that peace will fade. Why? Because it's dualistic and therefore not true. In the ego's procedure, this is reversed. The situation, and, and let me stop here for a second. Every time it says situation, think relationship. Because every situation in the world involves some form of relationship, whether it's special love relationship or relationship with others. So the situa word situation equals relationship. The situation becomes the determinant of the outcome, which can be anything. So what is the situation that the ego reverses? It wants the relationship for happiness. It thinks the relationship will become happy. The situation, people, place, things, and events. Okay. So unless we willingly know that what we want, why we want it, is we want to know the truth. Unless it's everything we, every relationship we pursue is for wanting to know the truth. We want to see the reflection of where we are in our mind's eye, in our awareness. 
you're, you're choosing it for the wrong reasons. Why do you want a new job? Yesterday, this is an example, I had a headhunter of a massive, massive multinational South African-based company. It's worth billions. And they offered me the CEO direct this, um, position. And the headhunter and the, and the outgoing CEO, they spent three hours on the phone with me trying to convince me to take the job. I said, won't make me happy. Yes, but you make so much money. Won't make me happy. Yes, but you can do this. You can lead. Won't make me happy. Convince me that this is going to make me happy. Because if it'll make me happy. And then I thought, okay, well, if I take this role and I, I offer it to my brothers, to whoever works there, to bring them a new way of seeing things, then great. So I said, well, can I bring about sort of new coaching? and you know, um, meta-coaching, bring in a new way of looking at things. Can I, can I come in and disrupt the way we do things? No, 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 you must just come manage it, make more money, but don't change anything. <laughs> What's the point there? I need to come and pour myself knowing. And um, I said, have you guys seen my YouTube videos? No, I said, go watch them and then, make, then let me know if you still want me to come work there. Get, get back to me by tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow afternoon, three o'clock. Well, this afternoon, three o'clock, they didn't phone me back. <laughs> they probably know, oh, thank God we didn't hire him as a propeller head. Well, if it was the right reason, and I would have taken that company to heights I'd never imagined, but I would have turned that entire organization into really a loving, happy organization. They're not happy. They're making millions, but they're not happy. I can promise you down below, that staff, the staff are unhappy. Put money on it. The boss is all happy. They're making millions. They're making bonuses. Are they really happy? No, that they don't. They're not. They're making money, and they think money is happiness, but they're not. Why do they need the money? Because they believe the money is going to make them happy. If they were happy, they wouldn't need to. The reason for this disorganized approach is evident. The ego, you body mind, you that thinks that you think, okay, does not know what it wants to come of any situation, to come of any relationship. It is aware what it doesn't want, but only that. It has no positive goal at all. Think about anything you've ever wanted. Why have you wanted it? Because you didn't want the opposite of not having what you thought it would give you. It's, you thought it would give you happiness. What did you not want? What you were experiencing, unhappiness, emptiness, sadness, whatever you were experiencing. So you pursued that in order to. You want to leave the company in order to. So if you pursued something from a place of unhappiness, you're resonating. Imagine specificity of vibration. You're resonating unhappy. You're in resistance. Something gets given you and you think it's going to make you happy. What are you going to draw onto yourself? The same resonance you are. So this amazing job comes your way, but because you're unhappy, that job is going to make you even more happy. If you're happy, on the other hand, Whatever comes your way, because you're happy, just extends is a place for you to extend your happiness and enhance your happiness by the knowing of yourself as that which brings happiness to everything. And so, without very, 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 very clear cut, and think about this: how often have you jumped into anything without very clear cut goals as to why you're doing it? Without a clear cut positive goal, in other words, wanting to offer yourself loving. Set at the outset, the situation just seems to happen and makes no sense until it has already happened. Then you try and look back. And then you try and look back on something. Why did I do this? If only she had done that. If only it did this. If only I'd been more. If only I'd given more. If only, if, if only, if only. Now you try and make sense of a senseless situation and you'll never come to an answer. You'll come up with a thousand reasons. And that's why people take 20 years to get over a relationship. If only I had, if only I had, filled with regrets because you're trying to make sense of that, which makes no sense at all. And then you look back at it and try and piece it together. You know, what it must have meant means nothing. Illusion means nothing. There's no meaning in this world. And you will be wrong no matter what you come up with. Because even if you were right about the illusion, the illusion is still an illusion, so you're wrong. <laughs> it's like the Arimbus, the snake, it turns around and bites itself in the bum. It just, it, there's no point. Okay. 
not only is your judgment in the past, so you're now trying to analyze something that never happened because it's the past. The past is gone. So now you're in the present, analyzing the past. So where are you in the past? And where's your judgment? You, you think you're judging now, but it's in the past. Where's your judgment? The past. Where's the past? Doesn't exist. So what are you judging? Nothing. But you have no idea what should happen or what should have happened. And that's why I should have, could have, would have. No goal was set with which to bring the means in line. And now the only judgment left to make is whether or not the ego likes it. Is it acceptable or does it call for vengeance? And that's why when you break up with someone or break up with a job, you want to punish them and show them, you know, and, um, and bad mouth them and be ugly about it. Show the middle bird. Okay. The absence of the, a criterion of outcome set in advance makes understanding doubtful and evaluation impossible. Although you do try very hard to evaluate it and then justify it to yourself that it wasn't right for you or they weren't right for you or you weren't right for them or whatever, or it was a toxic environment. That's the favorite new age, bliss bunny, woke generation. That's the, everything's toxic. Oh, it's a toxic environment. You know, that's holy, but that's toxic. If that's holy, that's a part of you that recognizes that it's holy. So it's you that's holy. Holiest place on earth is where an ancient hatred became a place of love. If it's toxic, it's you. It's not them. It's always you because them is a reflection of you. Okay. And so the value of deciding in advance what you want to happen is simply that you will perceive the situation as a means to make it happen. So what you choose is you choose to know thyself, be thyself knowingly. And Holy Spirit, whatever relationship you give me, I surrender unto and know that if the attraction kicks in, I'm meant to. If the vision comes up, I'm meant to pursue the vision. Vision, clarity. Vision always comes with clarity. There's no strategy required. You then put it into action, but it's with total clarity. An attraction comes and it pulls you together. Two people come together. And then you know, then you, then you set the intention. And of course, if they're like-minded, you can openly talk about it. And of course, you want to be in a relationship with someone that at least grasps your understanding of non-duality in the same way. You cannot, as a non-dualist, try and have a meaningful relationship with someone trapped in egoic dogma and duality, especially if they're religious. It won't work. That will be your greatest obstacle to peace. However, dedicate whatever relationship to the knowing of truth within self, even if the relationship seems to fail because the other person won't accept the non-dual Christ mind understanding. There is no other person that aspect of yourself work. It heals you. And so, and it brings awareness to self. So be very clear before you go into a relationship. If you go into a relationship because you want to feel special, because you're feeling unloved and lonely, you're going in the wrong relationship or into the, for the wrong reasons. If you meet someone and you really just want to joyously express yourself with them and you want to serve their highest Christ-minded ideal, and they want to do the same for you. Can you imagine a relationship where two people come to serve the divine in each other? What that would be like? And you set the intention when you come to that relationship. Or if you are married in a relationship and you've gone through your troubled waters or you're going through troubled waters, say, okay, I dedicate to God. I dedicate you to God. You dedicate me to God. I dedicate this relationship to God. Love is the absence of bodies. May we become mirrors of each other that show mirrors for each other that show us our subconscious pent up guilt. So if you say something and I get defensive, you raise it. So you're getting defensive again. Let's find it. Let's investigate. You're not angry for the reasons you think you are. You're angry because you dragged the past into now. You want to either prove the past wrong or you want to be vengeful towards the past. You project it onto me. I said something and you reacted negatively. Find that negativity. Okay, let's forgive. Let's forgive the situation. Let's go back to the past. Forgive the previous situation. Forgive, find the origin of the situation. It happened with your mother, happened with your first relationship. You've now projected your mother, our first, your first hurtful relationship onto me. They were always abusive. They always made you feel little. They always made you feel negative about yourself. I said something. You've seen it wrong. I, that's not what I meant, but that's how you've seen it. Let's investigate. You do that for me. I do that for you. And then you will therefore make every effort to overlook what interferes with the accomplishment of your objection 
and concentrate on everything that helps you meet it. So you'll look for every opportunity to practice forgiveness and you'll pay only attention. Your mind will immediately go to the voice for God. So instead of getting trapped in the, the, the trying to understand what he said, why he said it, why she said it, what do they mean by it? Why are they trying to hurt me? You're simply going to forgiveness and that forgiveness, full attention on forgiveness, release, release, release. Use the Ho'oponopono prayer, beautifully aligned with Course and Miracle. And you release it so that it reveals it's all you. It was my mother. It was my first relationship. I've now projected it onto you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. It's all me. Thank you. I love you. We are here. It is quite noticeable that this approach has brought you closer to the Holy Spirit sorting out of truth and falsity. The truth becomes what can be used to meet the goal. Practice forgiveness. Your only function in this world. The false becomes the useless from this point of view. Oh, he said something hurtful. You know, you're just like this. You're always like that. You didn't love me. You don't give me what I need. Blah, blah, blah. Always needs based. Ego always needs based. The situation now has meaning because you've offered it to the Holy Spirit, but only because the goal has made it meaningful. And the goal is to be thyself knowingly, to be thyself knowingly as that which is the extension of God's love eternally in the eternal now as you are Christ, the Holy Son of God. One, only one. Okay. The goal of truth has further, has further practical advantages. If the situation is used for truth and sanity, truth is sanity, the, its outcome must be peace. And this is quite apart from what the outcome is. If peace is the condition of truth and sanity and cannot be without them, where, where, peace, is, where peace is, they must be. Truth comes of itself, from itself, from your highest self, from your Holy Spirit, from your Christ mind within you. And it calls from you and you respond to the call from within, to the call of God from within. If you experience peace, it is because the truth has come to you and you will see the outcome truly. For deception cannot prevail against you who's now becoming aware of being awareness itself, because peace is truth. Okay. The ego wants to appropriate peace or joy, people, places, things, and events, okay. and doesn't want you to be aware of being aware, the I am. So remember, when you, when you pursue something and you get it, it seems like you're happy. But you're not happy because you got it. The ego will tell you that. You're happy because the ego has ceased to pursue and the minute it ceases to pursue, the ego stops and, and subsides. And that which is the awareness of being aware, the essence of your beingness, yourself, your soul, your shared being with God rises to awareness. Why? How does it rise to awareness? It rises to your awareness because you are awareness itself. And that's being no, when you know yourself as that which is awareness itself, you now be yourself knowingly, knowingly as that which is the awareness of being awareness itself. What is awareness? The mind of God. You will recognize the outcome because you are at peace. You've now, you've now stopped pursuing. You're at peace. It rises to the surface. Now you're not pursuing anything. You're just center, quiet in the thoughts, abide. And let the abidance rise into your awareness. Let the joy rise into your awareness. Let the peace rise. Peace leads to joy. Joy leads to the unconditional knowing of ourself as that which is the love of God. Here again, you see the opposite of the ego's way of looking. For the ego believes the situation brings the experience. The relationship brings the experience. The relationship brings me love. The job brings me happiness. The car brings me popularity and that gives me happiness. The child fulfills me, makes me feel loving. I feel loved and loved and needed. And that makes me happy. The relationship, the spouse, you know, if he does things in a certain way, she does things in a certain way, they serve me, they now make me happy because look, they love me. So they've adopted to one of the five love languages. They're giving me the five love languages. They love me. No, they don't. They're scared of losing you because you're whining so much. And now they're giving you love languages to shut you up. And then you give them their love language because if you give them their love language and they give you yours, then you, 
and you make the relationship work and all your friends think you're amazing. You despise each other. You hate each other. You drive each other mad. The only reason you stay together is for the sex and the dinner. That's it. Okay, That's not love. That is the, the total opposite of love. That's, that's sacrificing for the neediness of not wanting to be alone. The Holy Spirit knows that the situation, relationship, is as the goal determines it and is experienced according to the goal. And the ego always appropriates the goal and then makes you believe that you need the next one and let this one go and chase the next one. The goal of truth requires faith. But do you want to have faith in what you believe? And what do you believe? Be life. That what you don't know. When you know and you place your faith in the knowing, and you realize that I need faith in knowing, I know. <laughs> faith is implicit in the acceptance of the Holy Spirit's purpose. And this faith is all inclusive. So truth, when you know it, requires no faith because it's all inclusive in the knowing. Where the goal of truth is set, their faith must be. You don't have to have faith. It's the, it's the knowing of it. The Holy Spirit sees the situation as a whole, that which brings you to the awareness of being that which is the Christ. The goal establishes the fact that everyone involved in it will play his or her part in it, in its accomplishment, because you've said it, and it's inevitable. Even if the relationship then ends because one awakens to self and the other one chooses to remain asleep, that other one will awaken eventually. And when you awaken to self, there won't be the heartbreak that you had when other relationships, ego relationships ended. Because when ego relationships end, it feels like half of you has been split or beaten up or hurt or betrayed or abused or whatever the case may be. In a Holy Spirit relationship, when two fractured selves that have come together for the purposes of truth eventually split, it's only because one has gone further up the path and there is no more need for body involved. And that's inevitable. And it'll be so peaceful that that apparent separation of bodies, which can't join in the first place, will be so gentle, you'll leave as best friends and be happy that you've walked the path together. And that is inevitable. No one will fail in anything. You'll both play out what they need to. And sometimes people get sent your way only so that you can practice forgiveness, forgive and forget them. And then they'll go off and play the, their game somewhere else because the script is written. So some people come into your life to stay with you and through forgiveness, uh, a mighty companionship is born. And some come only to challenge you, to show you that you want to transcend it and no longer be part of it. And the minute you transcend it and you're no longer part of it, they're no longer part of your life. And then the ego says, oh, you should bring them back and you miss them and I'm missing my old friends. Your old friends were fractures of your own self, of your old self. Once you transcend to new ways of awareness, being aware of being aware, those that are unaware of being aware won't be able to stand in your light and they'll abandon you and reject you and run away. Why? Shadows don't want the light. And then the light starts to feel bad because shadows have run away. And then the light becomes a shadow again. Don't do that to yourself. Stay in the light and more lights will be sent your way at a whole new level of love, peace, joy in terms of the the composite nature of the new relationships. Of course, if those that are in shadows move with you into the light, they become the light with you, and those relationships stay together. Hence, if you're in a relationship now, make sure you're both dedicating the relationship for truth. This seems to ask for faith beyond you and beyond what you can give. And it's true, but you're not alone. Yet this is so only from the viewpoint of the ego. For the ego believes in solving conflict through fragmentation, understanding, putting things into boxes, analyzing the death out of it, and does not perceive a situation as whole. Yet the Holy Spirit sees it as whole and says, you're perfectly suited, so offer it. Therefore, it seeks to split off the segments of the situation and deal with them separately. For it has faith in separation and not wholeness. Confronted with any aspect of the situation, the relationship, that seems to be difficult, the ego will make an attempt to take this aspect elsewhere and resolve it there. So it'll break this off and go and have a relationship somewhere else. Or it'll 
keep you there because you cook really well and you look after the children. So it goes and has its romantic love relationship affair somewhere else, hoping it'll never be bust. It's, it's like the, the male that says, um, yeah, my wife and I are separated. So you and I must see each other in private because I don't want the children to be hurt. But one day I'll leave her. He's never going to leave her. If you sleep with him, before he's left, he's never going to leave her because now you're fulfilling his fantasies and, and he loves the idea of fantasy. And any woman that thinks he's going to change, you're mad. Never going to change. But if you've given in sexually, that hunt is over and you're now part of his expression. And once it's worn out, you'll go find something else. But you hang in there thinking it's going to be special. You have fun. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and never the two will see alike. That's the way the ego dream has been designed. And yet the Holy Spirit's appropriated the polarities in order to be drawn to each other sexually. Okay, why? Because of the typical DNA built program in us in order to propagate the species. And yet, if you dedicate that relation to the Holy Spirit, it won't be a boxing match. It will be a joining. And what look to each other for happiness, now look to God. And it will seem to be successful, except that this attempt conflicts with unity and must obscure the goal of truth. So what do you do? You get yourselves busy, you make a lot of money, travel here, travel there, do this, do that, invite friends, parties, parties, accessories, boats, cars, planes, trains, automobiles. Why? So you don't have to pay attention to each other <clears throat> because you are reflections of your dark mirror. And peace will not be experienced except in the fantasy that you create for each other. And so you take pictures and if all your friends think you have such an amazing relationship, Look how amazing your husband is. Look how amazing your wife is. Look how sexy. Look how hot. Look how young she still looks. Look how handsome. Look how tall. Look how much money he has. Fucking hate each other. You hate each other. The world's made up of this shit. Look at the wonderful relationships between the celebrities, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie. Last time I heard they were married, I don't know if they still are. But it doesn't. There's nothing fanciful about it. They're just human. Still use toilet paper. Truth has not come because faith has been denied, <clears throat> being withheld from where it rightfully belonged in the awareness of being aware. Thus, do you lose the understanding of the situation, the relationship, the, the goal of truth would bring? <clears throat> For fantasy solutions bring but the illusion of the experience and the illusion of peace is not the condition in which truth can enter. <clears throat> and so relationships fail because the conflict enters in just another form. So you replace one partner for the next, one job for the next, one relationship for the next, one city for the next, one country for the next, one hobby for the next. But it's happy and exciting in the beginning because it's all new while your mind is focusing on the detail and attention. But as soon as you settle in it, the emptiness returns. So you bought a Harley, it was amazing. And three years later, you got all the leathers and stuff. And then at there, it's no more fun. So you buy a boat and skiing, and that's amazing. And then, oh, no, let's go diving. Oh, and then it's the same thing. Let's go flying. Let's go skiing. And then they just go from one activity to the next, one activity to the next. And eventually, they become so bored with each other, they split off. There's another way to see it. Let's stop there and do some questions. We now come on to text chapter 17, forgiveness in the holy relationship, 17.7, the call for faith. Now, we immediately assume that the call for faith is to have faith in God or Christ or Jesus or the Holy Spirit. And that is true. We must have our full faith in God, full faith in God's Holy Spirit as our Holy Spirit faith in Christ as our highest awake mind, calling to ourselves to awaken into that mind, not duality, but also, and most importantly, while we're in duality, in, in the appearance of physical form, to have faith in our, each other, to have faith in our brother. Because what's the point of having faith in God, but not faith in each other? Because we are expressions of God's love. And so if we cannot have faith in each other, we then cannot claim to have faith in God. It's easy to have faith in the concept of a God, in that which is all loving and created us. 
But how will we know ourself until we know ourself as our brother? Because ourself is everyone in this world, everyone. Before time began and now, before we were born and long after we're in this world, everyone that's ever in form is a fractured part of our spirit, our spirit, our Holy Son of God spirit. There's only one of us dreaming, and we are that. We are still maybe asleep, but our highest mind, our highest part of our mind is awake, Christ. Jesus became that. Jesus is now Christ. No more Jesus. Jesus is gone. Body died 2,000 years ago. The spirit became the Christ, the lit, the light that brings the light of God, and God, God is the light with which we see. So the call for faith is the call for faith in one another. Because one another is a reminder of the love of God we are. The substitutes for aspects of the situation, relationship, remember, situation, relationship, are the witnesses to your lack of faith. So what are the substitutes for, act of the, for aspects of the situation? The substitutes are people, places, things, and events, and mostly people. They demonstrate, they mirrors, obviously, so they demonstrate that you did not believe the situation, the relationship, and the problem, separation, was in the same place. The problem was the lack of faith. And it is this you demonstrate when you remove it from its source and place it elsewhere. So you can't see a brother as sinful, asleep, stuck in the ego, and know yourself. You need to see beyond their body-mind locality their body-mind activity, their body-mind aspects, and know that the essence of them is Christ, is the love of God, and see them only that way. You can't, you, if you look at them and you see them sick, ill, suffering, egoic, evil, dark, and then you want to give them light, well, you've judged them as dark, and now you want to give them light. If they're dark, they won't, they can't get it. And just by your judgment of it, they won't receive it. Why? Because you think you're giving light, but you're actually projecting darkness because you're projecting judgment. As a result, you won't see the problem. And the problem is the fact that you're not in the awakened awareness, the fact that you're in your localized body-mind identification, seeing only problems and not realizing the problem is the mind, which is misperceiving and projecting its misperception. Had you not lacked faith in it, it could be solved. The problem would be gone. And the situation would have been meaningful, meaningful to you because the interference in the way of understanding would have been removed. Because the way of understanding is the realization it's all me. It's all the I am that appeared to be localized and then sees itself fractured as body minds separate from one another. To remove the problem elsewhere is to keep it because it's still the problem. You've just moved it somewhere else. For you remove yourself from it and make it unsolvable because it's only to thyself be true. Be thyself knowing me. There is no problem in any situation that faith will not solve. And faith is only in the Holy Spirit or the Christ mind, which is faith in the self the self, which is the extension of God's unconditionally loving essence. There is no shift in any aspect of the problem, but will make a solution impossible. So if you shift it, it makes it impossible. For your, you shift part of the problem elsewhere, and the meaning of the problem must be lost, and the solution to the problem is inherent in its meaning. So you say, well, it's them. So you push it outside you. They're acting this way. They're an ego. They're sick. They're evil. They're wrong. And now you want to know yourself as the love of God. And so you may have moments when you do in that recognition brought to you by the Holy Spirit, but you won't feel whole and complete until you are whole and complete, meaning that you recognize everything as the love and light for God. Everyone is a fractured self or abiding in you. It's all fragmentations of your spirit localized as body minds, in your mind, the dreaming mind of the Son of God. And so the only way we heal is we move into first advantage, first vantage position 
the I am that I am, the Christ mind. When we become in full knowing, in full knowing that which is the Christ mind, until then we're not healed. And as I say, and as you become aware, fully aware that you're the Christ mind, God takes the final step. You won't even have time to thank God, it says, because it will be, you recognize it, you realize it's all you, I'm just dreaming, and you're awake, you join the Christ mind. And no memory of you would ever exist. And now as the Christ mind, you keep, you've now joined. One more lantern has joined with the Christ mind. Thousands of lanterns have joined to the Christ mind. And eventually those lanterns will light up the mind. Is it not possible that all your problems have been solved, but you have removed yourself from the solution, not realizing you are the Holy Son of God? Yet faith must be where something has been done and where you see it done. And therefore, it's calling for proof. And the Holy Spirit says, I know, if I show you proof, it reinforces it, reinforces it, you believe it even more, you start to know it. And the more you know it, the more you believe it, the more you believe it, the more you know it. And what it just grows. The situation is a relationship being the joining of thoughts, fractured thoughts. What are body minds? Fractured or thoughts, thought forms in the dream. Thought forms, you fractured yourself. You are a thought in God's mind. And that thought has fractured itself into billions of thought forms. Those thought forms are then projected into physicality. You are a fractured thought form projected into physicality. And then seeing yourself from a localized position in the mind's dream, the universe, stuck on a planet in a body mind, traveling through space and time as physical matter, waiting to die. If problems are perceived, it is because the thoughts are judged to be in conflict. So you think you're holy or spiritual or whatever, and everybody else is asleep and, and evil. Step beyond the battlefield. It's all you. If you're seeing people asleep, evil, judgmental, etc., etc., your judgment of it judges you. You're asleep. It's all you, one you, the Holy Son of God. But if the goal is truth, this is impossible because then you recognize it's all me. And if as long as I'm seeing anything but love, I'm not fully at love yet. I have moments of it, but if I'm still seeing judgments, if I'm still entertaining thoughts, then I'm not fully there because happiness is without thought. Self, which is pure happiness, is without thought. It's just pure awareness. There's not a single thought in awareness. Some ideas of body must have entered separate bodies for minds cannot attack. The thoughts of bodies is the sign of faithlessness, for bodies cannot solve anything. It is their intrusion on a relationship, an error in your thoughts about the situation, which then become the justification for your lack of faith. Of faith. You see, look at those people, they're an ego, they're, they're evil, they're dark, they're whatever, and, and the judgment, not realizing the judgments, they're projected outward. And you will make this error. But be not concerned at all with that. The error doesn't matter. Faithlessness brought to faith will never interfere with truth. But faithful, faithlessness used against truth would always destroy faith. Okay, so faithlessness brought faith. So in other words, illusions brought to truth will never interfere with truth. But faithlessness used against the truth is a choice. It's a choice to fall asleep, stay asleep, will always destroy faith, the lack, the lack of knowing. If you lack faith, ask that it be restored where it was lost in your awareness and thus became your mind. So the minute you lost awareness, localized, you then call that awareness mind. And what is mind? Culmination of thoughts that become ideas, that become beliefs. They become dogma. They become your value systems. They become what you appropriate your identity to. Okay. So ask for it to be restored where it was lost and seek not to have it made up to you elsewhere as if you had been unjustly deprived of it. So I was, I was, 
I was not given the love I deserve, so I'll go look for it somewhere else, another job, another country, another person, another place, another thing, another event. Only what you have not given can be lacking in, in any situation. So what have you not given? Faith, love, unconditional acceptance of being. But remember this, the goal of holiness was set for your relationship because you've offered it and not by you. The minute you offered it, it was set for you by the memory for God in you, the memory of God, which is God's Holy Spirit as the very essence of what you are. You are a holy spirit extension of God. You did not set it because holiness cannot be seen except through faith and seen except through faith is known. And your relationship was not holy because your faith in your brother was so limited and little. So you say you love God and you're aware and you're conscious and you're loving, but you see your brother is evil or judgmental or lost in translation or whatever. If you're seeing him that way, it's still in your mind. Your faith must grow to meet the goal that, that has been set. The goal's reality will call this forth because it will prove it to you. For you will see the peace and the faith will not come separately. It's the same thing. Peace and faith are the same. What situation can be can you be in without faith and remain faithful to your brother? The whole world, and you guys heard Reuben say this, so minds are joined, the whole world is one relationship in which you cannot escape this. The whole world is one relationship of one fractured mind having a relationship with its fractures, trying to remember itself through relationship. <clears throat> Every situation in which you find yourself is but a means to meet the purpose for your set relationship, which is to know yourself as that which is the love of God. You are spirit. Everything abides in spirit as you abide in God. See it as something else and you are faithless. Use not your faithlessness. Let it enter and look upon it calmly, but do not use it. So what's the faithlessness? It's the doubting fears the doubting thought fear or the doubting fearful thoughts. Faithlessness is the servant of illusion, thoughts, and wholly faithful to its ego master. Use it, in other words, engage those thoughts and it'll carry you straight back to illusions. So you're all peaceful, you're sitting there meditating, ah, oh, top of the mountain, and the thought comes and says, but why is everyone suffering? When will the suffering end? And you're straight back into the surface. When you're in this peaceful situation, the thought comes. I wonder why the Amazon's being destroyed. And you're straight back into it. I wonder why people are so judgmental. Straight back into it. Even the most gentle. The minute you engage that thought, it pulls you straight back into the dream. Be tempted not by what it offers you. Lead me not into temptation, Lord's bread. It interferes not with the goal, but with the value of the goal to you. And that's when we start to lose faith in our belief because it's not showing up. It's not giving us the proof. And then we start to lose faith, especially if we placed our faith in a teacher or in a script or in a dogma or in a belief or in a religion or a technique. And now it's not working. And now it starts to diminish your self-awareness. Accept not the illusion of peace it offers, but look upon its offering and recognize it is illusion. Every thought, illusion. All thought, illusion. The only true thought you have on the thoughts you have with God, and the thought you have with God is only one thought, and that's the power of one, and that is the unconditional love of all. That's it. If it's not an unconditionally loving thought, which means an unconditionally loving thought is a non-judgmental thought. And is there such a thing as a non-judgmental thought? Can a thought not judge? Of course it can't. All thoughts are judgmental. Even you may think, yeah, but I have loving thoughts. No, you don't. You don't have a single thought. What you think is a loving thought is the unconditional acceptance of what is, and there's no thought to it. All thoughts are illusion because all thoughts are judgment. And judgment is illusion. And judgment is an illusion that keeps you trapped in illusion 
As forgiveness is an illusion, it sets you free from illusion. So judgment is the opposite of forgiveness. One sets you free, the other one keeps you here. The goal of illusion is as closely tied to faithlessness as faith to truth. If you lack faith in anyone to fulfill and perfectly his part in any situation dedicated in advance to truth, your dedication is divided. And the minute it's divided, you're back into the ego mind. And so you have been faithless to your brother and used your faithlessness against him. No relationship is holy unless its holiness goes with it everywhere. And so it's always holy. There's no holy place in the world. The whole thing is in the holy, God, the holy place, which is God's mind, although we think it's somewhere else. We think it's the universe. As holiness and faith go hand in hand, so, so must its faith go everywhere with it. So have faith in your brothers. The goal's reality will call forth and accomplish every miracle needed for its fulfillment because it'll give you proof because it's true and proof is always given to that which is true. Nothing too small or enormous, no, er, no levels of difficulty in miracles or too weak or too compelling, but will be gently turned to its use and purpose to prove to you that only truth is true. The universe will serve it, serve it gladly. What does this mean? Is the universe serving you? No. The universe is a reflection of you and therefore serves you in showing you the proof because it's all you. The universe exists in your spirit as your spirit exists in God. All of it is in you, in your mind. The entire universe, holy son of God, you've dreamt it up. All of it. The universe will serve it gladly as it serves the universe. But do not interfere. The power set in you, whom, God, whom the Holy Spirit's goal has been established, is so far beyond your little conception of the infinite that you have no, how deep, no idea how great the strength that goes with you. If you are made from the self-safe same essence as God, and God is the omnipresent, all-powerful essence of everything, then you have imbued in you the very essence of you is God's power. If God created the sun and, and, and extended the sun, the same power, which is God, could the sun surely not create anything he wanted to? And remember this, that what appears to be his creation, the universe, is only but a dream. It's not real. What does God's son extend in truth? The love, the light, the peace the joy, which in its very essence is the son, which is the very essence and extension of the father. And you can use this in perfect safety, yet for all its might, so great it reaches past the stars, beyond the universe, it's eternal. And to the universe that lies beyond them, God's kingdom. And your little faithfulness can make it useless if you, you would use the faithlessness instead. So this incredible power you have, when you doubt, when you fear, it doesn't end your, your, your power, but it collapses your awareness of it as you localize the body mind. And then you're not aware of the divine self you are, that which extends the love of God eternally. Faithlessness is your block to awareness. It's your obstacle to peace, your final one. And especially obstacle to peace in your brother. And therefore, especially in special love relationship, because that's where all the pent up guilt and fear comes to the surface to be cleared in the light of awareness through the practice of forgiveness. Yet think on this and learn the cause of faithlessness. You think you hold against your brother what he has done to you. But what you really blame him for is what you did to him because you've created all of this. And so you've projected onto him what you thought he needed to be. He didn't play it up. And now you've attacked him for it. So you're hurting you and you're hurting him because all of it abides in you. It is not his past that you hold against him. And your lack in faith because of what you were. 
Okay. So it's, it is yours that you hold against. It's not his. And it's your lack of faith in him because of what you were. So get this perfectly clear. You blame him for everything that hurts you in the past. But what hurt you in the past? Your memory of it. So it's not his past, but yours that you hold against him. And you didn't have faith in them. And you didn't have it now. And it's your lack in faith, of faith in him because of what you were in the past or what you thought you were. Yet, you are as innocent of what you were as he is. Whatever was never, whatever never was, is causeless. There's no cause, and therefore can not have an effect, and is not there to interfere with truth, unless you believe in illusion. There is no cause for faithfulness, but there is cause for faith, and that's a capital cause, because the cause of faith is God. That cause has entered any situation and shares its purpose, capital its. Okay, so what's the cause? God's Holy Spirit in the dream. And what's its purpose? That you remember yourself as that which is God's Holy Spirit. The light of truth shines from the center, from your heart space, to all relationships, any, to all the situation, and touches everyone to whom the situation's purpose calls. And it calls to everyone because everyone abides and lives in you, which you use spirit and they are spirit and you're all spirit. And that means one thought in the mind of the dreaming son of God, which is pure spirit. There is no situation that does not involve your whole relationship with the entire universe in every aspect and complete in every part. Why? The entire universe is in your mind. You can leave nothing of yourself outside it and keep the situation holy. For if it shares the purpose of your whole relationship and, and it derives its meaning from it, and therefore it's all you. Enter each situation or enter each relationship with the faith you give your brother or you are faithlessness to your own relationship. Your faith will call the others to share your purpose has the same purpose called forth the faith in you. If you're watching me, you've responded to me in faith as I responded to Holy Spirit in faith, as I respond to you in faith. This is proof that this, what just we've just read, is actually happening and therefore is true right here and now. And you will see the means you once employed to lead you to illusions transformed to means for truth. Because all of you are rogues. And so you went and found the rogue teacher. You didn't go and find the happy, happy, gentle teacher. You went and found the rogue. Because every single one of you watching this, and it's resonating with you, you're a rogue. You're a rogue teacher. And rogue teachers are attracted to rogue teachers. Why are we rogues? Because we were the rebels. We are the rebels. We fight authority. Because we have an authority problem, but we project it into the world. And we're independent. And we're the sigma males of this world. And we're the sigma women of this world. We're not betas, we're not alphas, we're the sigmas, we don't give a fuck what people think, we don't care, we're different, we embrace our differences, we don't think we're special, we don't think anyone is special, we don't care what we think, we don't, we don't care what anyone else thinks, we say fuck, we smoke, and yet we're aware that we're aware. It doesn't matter, we're not trying to be spiritual, we're not trying to be angelic, we are that which we are. Even the beautiful Maria Lara, who's just so angelic, even she's a rogue, even she's a bit of a rebel. Every single one of you that finds me, there's a rebel in all of you. And so what's a rebel? It's an illusion. It's an illusion of defiance against what? Ego. And what defies against ego? Ego. And so our egoic selves, our fractured selves, are nothing but rogues. And yet the very essence of what we are is as holy as the most holy looking person on this planet. Because the essence of all of us is the essence of spirit, God's Holy Spirit. And so we've been drawn to each other so that we can expose our sinful guilt subconscious mind. And as we bring it to the surface, as I answer the call to God's Holy Spirit, and I called forth to teach when I thought I would never say another word ever again about the subject. So you respond. And as you respond to me, I respond to you. So the teacher-student relationship is maximal. You reflect the light in me as I reflect the light in you. Because we are one one holy son of God, abiding in God as God abides in us. That's it. 
when the Holy Spirit, our memory of God, changed the purpose of our relationship because the memory has now brought us into the awareness of what we are. So all relationships change by exchanging yours for his, for the memory of God. The goal, the memory of God placed there was extended to every situation in which you enter or will ever enter. And every situation was thus made free of the past, sinful guilt, which would, may, which would have made it purposeless. And yet you call for faith because of him, your memory of God, your Holy Spirit in you, who walks with you in every situation. You are no longer holy and sane. So rogue teaches for God, nor are you longer, no longer alone. For loneliness in God must be a dream. So when you're lonely, hey, where are you? You're, you're out of awareness. Because the minute you return to the I am that I am and become aware of that is, man, you're so lifted. Take it from someone who suffered. My greatest suffering as a body mind was loneliness. Wouldn't know how to be lonely anymore. Just it's impossible. It cannot come into my space. The alone time is great. The time with others is great. Attached to nothing. Detached from nothing. Reject nothing. Yet connected to all of it because it's all in my mind. And it just serves my joy. And this wasn't a joyous being. This was a person. If I can, you can. And you certainly will. And greater things than I've done, you will do. You whose relationship shares the Holy Spirit's goal, our Holy Spirit's goal, are set apart from loneliness because the truth, the light, the love, the Christ has come. Its call for faith is strong. God's call you, within you for faith is strong. Do not use your faithfulness against it. Don't let thoughts intrude, Holy Son of God, Holy Teacher for God, for it calls you to salvation and to peace. It calls you to know yourself as that which is saved and that which is peace and that which is the love of God. You are the kingdom. You abide in God. God abides in you. We are one. Stop there. We do some questions. Now we come to the last section of text chapter 17, A Course in Miracles, Forgiveness and the Holy Relationship. And um, this now brings us into the 17.8, um, the conditions of peace. And this is something we must be vigilant for. Um, what is required in order for peace to be known? Because peace is always there. Joy is always there. Love is always there. The self is always there. God is always there. But while we are in ego mind in projection and justification and judgment, we cannot know ourselves as that which is the I am, that I am, the awareness of being awareness itself. And so it says it so beautifully, the holy instant is nothing more than a special case or an extreme example of what every situation is meant to be. Every situation, every relationship. Now I've shared with this, this with you before, um, a couple of chap uh, chapters back, holy instant, the holy instant is nothing more than being fully present in the eternal now, in total silence, in complete awareness of awareness itself, being awareness itself. It's taking the first mover position, the I am, and sinking deeper into that essence and becoming that which the only statement for it is, I am that I am. And in that total still, stillness and silence, the awareness of being the essence of joy and peace and love, that which is the extension of God's essence eternally in the eternal now. That's it. There's, and even those, even that description doesn't do it any service. And so the holy instant the choice for silence and stillness in the knowing of self is what every relationship is supposed to be. Why? Because it all exists in our mind. 
And when it's no longer seen outside ourselves as people, places, things, and events, for we know that the essence of everything is spirit, and that spirit is just fractured or form, thoughts in form, formless thoughts, abiding in ourself, which is God's Holy Spirit. Fractured spirit thought forms, returning and abiding in the total oneness and knowingness of the Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Son of God's Spirit, the Christ mind, oneness. And that's how every situation should be, because there's only one relationship. And that is the relationship, I am spirit and I abide in God. God is spirit and abides in me. The Father and I are one. The meaning that the Holy Spirit's purpose has given, given it has also given to every situation. Why? Because there's only one situation, and that is the dreaming mind. It calls forth just the same suspension, su suspension of faithfulness, faithlessness, withheld and left unused, that faith, the knowing, might answer the call of truth. And only true is truth. Truth is true, and it's the knowing of oneself. The holy instant is the shining example, the clear and equivocal demonstration, no doubt, of the meaning of every relationship and every situation seen as a whole, one mind dreaming it all up, returning to itself. Faith has accepted every aspect of the situation, and faithlessness has not forced any exclusion on it. It is a situation of perfect peace. It's the knowing of perfect peace, simply because you have let it be what it is, the silent stillness of the self. This simple courtesy is all your essence, your Holy Spirit asks of you. Let truth be what it is. Do not intrude upon it with thoughts. Do not attack it with thoughts. Do not interrupt its coming with thinking. Let it encompass every situation and bring you peace. Make you aware that you are peace itself. Not even faith is asked of you. For truth asks of nothing. Ask for nothing. Let it end. It's already there. Become aware of it. And it will call forth and secure for you the faith you need for peace, the awareness you need for peace. But rise you not against it. Don't bring thoughts to it. For against your opposition, it cannot come. Against your resistance, it cannot come. Would you not want to make a holy instant of every situation? Well, in truth, every situation is the holy instant. You just seem to split that holy instant into space, time, and matter. For such is the gift of faith, freely given where, wherever faithful, faithlessness is laid aside, unused. And then the power of the Holy Spirit's purpose is free to use instead, because now you know it as yourself. This power instantly transforms all situations into one sure and continuous means for establishing the Holy Spirit's purpose and demonstrating its reality as your reality and the only reality that exists. What has been demonstrated is called for faith and has been given. it. Now it becomes a fact from which faith no longer can be without. The strain of refusing faith to truth is enormous, and that's where all our grief lies far greater than you realize. But to answer truth with faith entails no, in, entails no strain at all. Why? Because it is what you are. To you, Holy Son of God, who have acknowledged the call of your Redeemer, God's Holy Spirit, as that which you are, the strain of responding to his call seems to be greater than before. So it's now really calling you. It's starting to accelerate in you. You want to be in this space and awareness more and more. This is not so. Before the strain was there, you attributed it to something else, believing that something else produced it. It was a call for a romantic love relationship 
the call for love to own, to possess, vision, create, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. or even just be ignorant of it. We call ignorant bliss. If ignorance was bliss, we would have stayed in ignorance, but it wasn't. It was never true. For the, for what for what the something else produced was really sorrow and depression, sickness, pain, darkness and dim imaginings of terror, cold fantasies of fear, and fiery dreams of hell. And it was nothing but an, an intolerable strain of refusing to give faith to truth, to knowing yourself and seeing its evident reality. Okay, so remember, you'll know this. To, to you who have acknowledged the call of your Redeemer, the strain of not responding to his call seems to be greater than before. It's not so. It's just, it wants to become all of you because it is all of the only thing that exists, not just all of you, all of everything, the love of God. And such was and is because you crucify yourself with every thought you have, every attack thought you have of others or self. So you think, oh, Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago. What a terrible thing to do. You're doing that to you. And since Jesus is an activity of the same dreaming mind, now the Christ, you are crucifying you and all your brothers, entire universe, and Christ with every negative thought, opposition thought, resistant thought, attack thought, judgmental thought you have, you crucify the Son of God again. You, Holy Son of God. So not such was, but such is still while you do this. Such was the crucifixion of the Son of God. His faith, faithlessness did this to him, is doing it to you. Think carefully before you let you, yourself use faithlessness against him again. Okay, Because him is you and your brothers are you. So if you have no faith in your brothers, you have no faith in Christ or even the idea of Jesus 2,000 years ago or even your idea of Jesus in heaven, you're crucifying that idea of the oneness with God Every time you see yourself as a sinner, or you see your brother as a sinner, you see yourself as unworthy, unloved, guilty, guilty somewhere else, you stop crucifying. And the only way you stop is give your, at all your attention to right-minded Holy Spirit. Whenever the thought comes, no engagement. Don't try and destroy the thought. Don't try and love the thought. Don't try and eradicate the thought. Don't try and out-argue the thought. The ego just disappears and comes back a different way. You can't beat that but you can beat it by giving it no attention. <clears throat> for he is risen, for you are risen, Holy Son of God, and you have accepted the cause of his, yours awakening as yours, because it's one and the same. You have assumed your part in his redemption, in your redemption, and you are now fully responsible to him and you, for there's only one of you. Fail yourself not now. Fail him not now where it has been given you to realize what your lack in faith in him must mean to you. Now, first time reader of, the whole, of this Course of Miracles, it's telling him, have your faith in Jesus. Because if you crucify yourself, you crucify in Jesus. Now seen from a complete non-dualistic perspective, because we're ready for this now. It's Jesus, activity of the mind. You in activity of the mind. When Jesus dissolved, becomes Christ's mind. When you dissolve, you become Christ's mind. While you see Jesus as a savior outside you, you crucify him. While you see yourself as a sinner, you crucify him. While you see your brother as a sinner, you crucify him. Now let's bring it all within. There's one dreamer. While you crucify yourself, Jesus, or anyone else, you crucify but self. The self is all. And the truth of you is you are Christ's mind, imbued with God's Holy Spirit, the very essence of God, extending forever the love, joy, and peace, which is the light and love of God eternally, in the eternal now forever. You. Always you. His, yours, salvation is your only purpose. See only this in every situation, and it will be a means for bringing only this. The Holy Spirit is the cause of the awakening to the call from God for you, his, his son, to awaken. That's it. So it's God, essence, calling you to awake. When you have accepted truth as the goal for your relationship, the goal, be thyself knowing you. You become a giver of peace as surely as your father gave peace to you. 
or the goal of peace cannot be accepted apart from its condition. And you had faith in it, not you had faith in it, for no one accepts what he does not believe is real. Okay. The goal of peace cannot be accepted apart from its conditions, accepted apart from its relationships. Its relationships, you with your fractured self. And you had faith in it, for no one accepts what he does not believe is real. So you do believe it's real. Your purpose has not changed and will not change, for you accepted what you can never change. You are the son of God, forever guiltless, forever free in the mind of God. Thoughts cannot leave their mind. And so you are a thought activity, a thought of love in God's mind. And as God extends love, extends these loving thoughts, so you extend the love of God too. And nothing that it needs to be forever changeless can you withhold from it. Nothing, nothing needs to be forever changeless. Can you now withhold from it? Your release is certain. Give as you have received, because by giving, you know you have it, and having and giving is the same. And demonstrate that you have risen, be the light of the world. Any situation that could hold you back, no judgment, and keep you separate from him, God, whose call you have answered, because you are one with him. Stop there. I hope this has brought clarity to you. Listen to it as often as you need to. Share it with your friends. But understand that this Course in Miracles way of teaching is understanding the non-duality of I abide in God and God abides in me. Father and Son are one. As I am in the Father, the Father is in me. And we are all in me, one dreamer. It appears to be localized as you. It appears to be localized as me. But there's one mind dreaming us up. And there's that mind that I take that position. First mover advantage. I move it to the first move of observation. I am. And then I just sink in. And the little I disappears. The I am fades. And the I am simply becomes a whisper. I am that I am. And the awareness takes over. And that is the bridge of the Holy Spirit, of our Holy Spirit, that God created and planted in us so that we would remember him, the memory of God in our mind. And as we create that bridge created by the light of God's Holy Spirit. As we prepare for it, we move into a place of peace. God takes the final step and brings us home. Knowingly. Stop there and we will then continue next week. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for sharing with this journey with me. I am that I am. We are one. Amen.